News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello, welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Douglas Mpuga, and here is what's coming up. Niger is a linchpin right now towards stability in the Sahel, and it has done significantly better than its neighbors. That's, that was Charles Combe reporting an outbreak of unidentified illness in Tanzania. Also, mourners pay respect to Ghanaian football star Christian Achu, who died in, in the Turkey Syria quake, and Central African nations joined to bolster their regional economy. All this and more coming up on African News Tonight. Leaders of Central African states meeting in Cameroon have announced reductions and bans on some imports to encourage local production and create jobs. The import restrictions will affect clothing, food and manufactured goods, mostly from China, Russia, Ukraine and the European Union. Leaders say the changes are aimed at reducing the economic damage caused by the COVID pandemic and Russia's war in Ukraine. Moki Edwin Kinzika reports from Yaoundé, Cameroon. Central African leaders say an ongoing economic slowdown is stifling development, increasing food and fuel prices, and making living conditions unbearable for a majority of the region's 55 million people. The leaders from Cameroon, the Central African Republic, Chad, Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, and the Republic of Congo met in Yaoundé Friday to accelerate structural reforms. Daniel Onaondo is the president of the Central African Economic and Monetary Community, CEMAC. He says conference attendees decided that Central African states will tackle the crisis by reducing or stopping imports on food and manufactured goods. Ondo says Central African states will produce goods and grow food locally to boost their economies following a severe recession triggered in 2015 when the international price of oil dipped below $50 forcing many oil exporting countries to scale back production. He says in 2019, the COVID-19 pandemic triggered one of the largest global economic crises in the world. And in 2022, Russia's war in Ukraine provoked extreme price shocks and disruptions in the supply of food crops and oil in Central Africa. Ondo said CEMAC, through its financial reforms program, is allocating about $5 million for projects, including import substitutions, over the next five years. He said the funds will be raised through contributions from member states and loans. Before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Central African states relied on Russia and Ukraine for 80% of their wheat imports, and 60% of petroleum products. Russia's invasion caused disruptions in supply and price hikes, including a 40% spike in the cost of fuel. CEMAC says most of the imported products could be grown locally. Cameroon's president, Paul Beer, is the outgoing chairperson of the CEMAC Conference of Heads of State. Le monde change. Bia says solidarity is needed more than ever before among CEMAC member states to jointly put an end to several crises that are making living conditions difficult and causing despair among civilians. Bia says CEMAC member states that are still reluctant to reducing imports should open their borders for the free movement of goods and people which is necessary in speeding economic growth and development. Bia said CEMAC members want to establish resilient, stable and prosperous communities at home. The leaders also agreed to continue negotiations to merge the 11-member Economic Community of Central African States, ACAS, with the six-member Central African Economic and Monetary Community, CEMAC, in a move to boost trade and growth. ACAS consists of all CEMAC member states plus Angola, 
Burundi, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Rwanda, and Sao Tome and Principe, Moki Edwin Kinzaka, for VOA News, Yaoundé, Cameroon. Health officials in Tanzania are investigating an illness that killed five people in the country's northwest with Ebola-like symptoms, raising fears that it could be the deadly virus. Charles Kombe reports from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Tanzania's Ministry of Health late Thursday issued a statement saying seven people in northwest Kagera region showed symptoms such as fever, vomiting, bleeding, and kidney failure. The ministry sent audio comments by chief medical officer to Maininagu to media. She says rapid response teams at the regional and council level have been sent to probe the known disease to understand and analyze it further. Nagu says samples have been taken from patients to identify the source of the disease. Social media posts in Tanzania noted the symptoms were like those for Ebola a deadly virus that causes high fevers, severe bleeding, and organ failure. Kagera borders Uganda, which had an outbreak of the rare Sudan strain of Ebola from September last year to January that was blamed for 77 deaths. Albert Chalamila is regional commissioner of Kagera. In audio comments his office sent to media, he said they were taking precautions. Sisi katika mkoa Kagera, Chalamila says they have continued to educate residents regarding the importance of taking all necessary precautions, including for COVID-19 and other illnesses such as Ebola. He says as of now, there are no reports of anyone having contracted the Ebola virus. Tanzania is not unfamiliar with rare and mysterious diseases, but has never recorded a case of Ebola. An outbreak in the southeast last year of leptospirosis, a bacteria spread by rat urine, sickened 20 people and caused three deaths. In 2019, a disease with Ebola-like symptoms that killed one woman who had visited Uganda led the WHO to question the government's response and lack of sharing information. At the time, the neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo was struggling with an Ebola outbreak that was the second largest on record, lasted nearly two years, and killed more than 2,000 people. Charles Kombe, for VU News, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. The International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant today for Russian President Vladimir Putin, accusing him of being responsible for the war crime of illegally deporting children from Ukraine. Moscow has repeatedly denied accusations that its forces have committed atrocities in its war against its, its neighbor. The court also issued the warrant for Maria Lavrova Belova, Russia's Commissioner for Children's Rights, on the same charges. Ukraine says more than 16,000 children have been illegally transferred to Russia or Russian occupied territories in Ukraine. A foreign minister spokesman said on social media. The decisions of the International Criminal Court have no meaning for Russia, which is not a party to the court. A choir sings at a funeral ceremony in Accra to honor Ghanaian football star Christian Achu, who was killed in the earthquake in Turkey last month. Thousands of people honored Achu, beloved not only for his 65 appearances for Ghana in international play, and his role on English Premier League teams, but also for his charity and humility. The state-assisted funeral was held at the forecourt of the State House in the capital Accra. Achu will be interred tomorrow in his hometown, Dogobome. Journalist Kent Mensa was at the State House, and he spoke with mourners there. Solomon Ajay said the turnout of the crowd is a lesson for all. Well, I think what we just saw here is a big testament that Ghanaians do love Christian Achu. A life well lived, but uh, cut off suddenly by this, you know, tragedy. Um, you look at the dignities that attended this particular ceremony, it tells you that it has really touched the hearts of a lot of people. And uh, for me, I think it's a huge lesson to everyone out there. 
VH star or a mere person. Live your life well and you'll be celebrated. Our Bena Akocho says as big a football fan, she had closely followed Achu's career. There was never a Black Stars match that, you know, Christian Achu played that you wouldn't hear about him or how much he contributed to the success of the Black Stars in that particular match. But putting his career aside, it wasn't such a big shock to many when his generous and philanthropic nature came to light after he passed. He helped so many people and changed so many lives. Fifi Anaman admits he didn't know much about Ashu until after his death, but says he set an example for all. An incredible humanitarian. Now he did work for the UK charity Arms Around the Child. He also did work with the Ghanaian charity Crime Check Foundation. And of course, on social media, a lot of people came out of the woods to express their gratitude to him after he helped many people on the quiet. So I guess Christina Chu's legacy is one that will see him being remembered as an incredibly talented footballer and, of course, a very, very kind man. And Ghanaians are really going to miss him. In fact, Ghanaians have really learned a lot about him after his death than they did know about him when he was alive. And we can only wish him um, a peaceful rest at this point. You're listening to African News Tonight. I'm Douglas Simpoga in Washington. Thousands of migrants deported from Algeria have been abandoned in the desert of northern Niger. The medical aid organization Doctors Without Borders, known as MSF, says the migrants arrived on foot in Asamaka, a town in northern Niger's Agadez region. They are stranded without access to shelter, health care, protection, and basic necessities. Men are shattering in the MSF-supported integrated health center in Asamaka. Earlier on, I spoke with Mohamed Sise, MSF advocacy manager, about the situation. As stated in our communication, we've been intervening in Asamaka uh, since um, 2017. And currently, we're now seeing a situation where our health center is being overwhelmed by migrants who are usually trans people who are in a migration situation who are usually in transit. And um, unfortunately, the service which they would receive to assist with the transit is, isn't sufficient for the number of migrants we're seeing. So they're having to resort to whatever means necessary to survive. And this is particularly difficult in a context like Asamaka, which is very close to, well, I mean, very much close to the desert. Temperatures can become very hot, it can be very dry, but it can conversely also be very cold at night. So we've seen that they're setting up makeshift tents, they're staying in areas with very poor sanitation and hygiene. And what we would state is extremely urgent is that other actors who are based in the Agadez region scale up responses and provide humanitarian assistance specifically shelter and protection and we are talking of thousands of these migrants and they are all unable to get back to their respective home countries we're not involved in the where they're trying to go or how they get back to their home countries i am aware that uh, iom manages a voluntary re uh, repatriation program which is usually functioning quite well but yes to your earlier point, we would estimate that there's about 3,500 migrants who are unsupported at the moment. What uh, help or assistance are you getting from the international community or ECOWAS? At the moment, we're seeing very little assistance or, or I should say inadequate assistance for the numbers that involve. Usually, I should highlight that this is an unprecedented situation. Uh, we are used to treating migrants who are transitioning back and some who are involved in the, with IOM, I assume. But um, at the moment, with the numbers that I've stated that are present, 
and the services which are available, there's a big disparity. And this is why we made this communication, basically to call on the international community and ECOWAS to intervene. That was Mohamed Sisse, MSF Advocacy Manager. He spoke with me from Dakar. A military patrol vehicle hit a mine late yesterday in northern northeast Nigeria, killing three troops and wounding 11 others, including civilians. The French news agency AFP says it occurred 10 kilometers from Banki, home of a camp for 45,000 people displaced by extremist fighting. Also caught in the blast was a truck carrying residents from the regional capital Maiduguri to Banki for, for governorship and state assembly elections tomorrow. Seven passengers sustained shrapnel injuries. Anti-extremist militia blamed the bombing on the Islamic State West Africa province, which is active in the region. The World Health Organization says Burundi has declared a polio outbreak after detecting its first cases of the crippling virus in over 30 years. The French news agency AFP says the UN has diagnosed eight cases of type 2 polio virus. Burundian health authorities detected the disease in an unvaccinated four-year-old as well as two children who came in contact with him. Authorities say they are ramping up efforts to vaccinate the illness, which can lead to paralysis or death.